Anyone who sets out on a five-day, 1,000-mile high-speed journey over 54 special stages on April the 1st has to be an optimist. Things on April Fool's Day in Ireland are unlikely to go according to plan, and certainly they got off to rather a slow start. The pace to come is not reflected in the crowds in Belfast City Hall, as the large crowd awaits for the arrival of the first car. Europe's rally aces sit frustratedly in the Good Friday city centre traffic as the clock ticks past the 10 a.m. start time. At last, there are signs of activities as 001 battles through the impatient fans. Not much to photograph as yet, except the rare sight of a co-driver on foot. As the National Union of Navigators have an informal meeting, everybody is relieved to see the late arrival of Jimmy McRae's Opel Ascona 400 for the start of the 52nd Circuit of Ireland Rally. Most would give the likeable Scott a very good chance of putting himself into the history books as the first person ever to win this Easter event four times in a row. Jimmy, who has made Irish tarmac rallying and the British Championship his own in recent years, knows that only a fool would discount the opposition in the 1983 circuit. Among them, seven times Swedish champion Stig Blomqvist, the fastest four-wheel drive exponent in the world. The Audi Quattro, since it last unleashed its turbocharged five cylinders on Irish soil, has undergone considerable tarmac development. The star attraction is the Lancia Rally, similar to this year's Monte winner, and driven by Penti Auricola. The other representative from Finland is Henry Toivonen in the second Rothmans Opel, and no one underestimates his ability. Now that you're a family man, do you find you're driving more cautious? Well, no, not really. Of course, uh, I must say that maybe the concentration is not the same level than it has been before, at least now, because you know, I'm really looking forward to see my daughter again. But uh, I, have, I haven't had a drive for two months, so I'm really looking forward to this rally now. Do you think number four will be more lucky for you this Easter than it was last Easter? Well, I hope to be more clever. I think it's not really a luck. Would you be surprised if an Irishman won this circuit this year? Well, it's, there is always that possibility. They are very, very quick here on their own island, so there's few, few, few uh, Irish who, who will be really dangerous for us. Per Eklund is seated number five in the Group A Toyota Corolla due to his stature as an A-graded driver. In the Vauxhall Chevette, the man with one of the best circuit records of all, Russell Brooks, who already has two wins, two seconds and a Group A victory under his belt. Russell knows better than most how to pace himself for this marathon event. At the scrutiny, there has been a last-minute entry. Billy Coleman made a late phone call to the organisers, arrived late afternoon and is scheduled to start late at number 70. His car, the RS 1800 Escort, was driven last year by the then world champion, Ari Vatnan. And as the saying goes, better late than never. Other Irish hopefuls include Fisher's Opel and another Lancia Rally. It's a very standard road going version, engine-wise and gearbox. The suspension is absolutely off the shelf. The uh, brakes will have changed the pedal box on it, with large, larger brakes in the front of it. And of course, we've lightened the car a bit with fiberglass. One new feature of the rally cannot go unnoticed. The start of a three-year deal with Rothmans to sponsor the circuit. The evidence is everywhere and very welcome for the first Rothmans Circuit of Ireland. And so the beautiful Irish countryside is ready to host one of the spectacles of the European motorsport calendar. Today's route takes in ten stages in County Antrim before returning to Belfast for an overnight halt. 
McCartney's exotic Lancia pilots us out the M1 for the first stage, eight miles north of Belfast. Pace notes have been permitted for the Friday stages, a move welcomed by the visiting drivers as it reduces the advantage of local knowledge to the Irish competitors. Reggie McSpadden in one of the official 00 cars opens the action on five days and nights of one of motorsport's greatest shows. Indeed, pace notes are immediately significant. But Jimmy McRae is slightly off the pace at Nettlebush and is 10 seconds down on his young teammate Toivonen. And annihilated by 21 seconds by the Swede Stig Blomqvist in the Audi Quattro. Auricula is definitely rusty, and the powerful Lancia is not proving an easy car to tame. But despite this misadventure, he still sets fifth fastest time. The supercar pace note combination is staggeringly fast. Brooks isn't bothered by the supercars. He knows it's early days yet for the Rothman circuit. The German champion Harold de Muth in the Mini Quattro, the Audi 80, is giving the car its World Rally debut on tarmac. At 8 and 9, two former British national champions, Vauxhall's Terry Kaby in the Blydenstein prepared HSR Chevette, and Ford's Malcolm Wilson in the Group A Escort RS 1600i. Eklund is setting the target times in Group A. But one of his main rivals, Chris Lord, is having to cope with a misfire in the Mazda. Next up is the fastest local, Bertie Fisher. And Desi McCartney gives of his best in the unmodified and privately entered Lancia Rally, a beautiful Italian beast. Billy Coleman's late entry is showing early signs of retirement and sadly the Cork legend is destined to last only to the end of this, the very first stage, due to a loose oil union. But somebody who is above all this must have been giving Dubliner Austin McHale flying lessons. The rally now makes a brief sortie up the famous Glens of Antrim. The next major test is renowned as one of the fastest, most spectacular and damaging 12-mile strips of tarmac in this part of the country. First to run the gauntlet, McRae, who climbs up to second place after his unleisurely trip round the coast. Auricula is getting well used to the supercharged Lancia. But the Opel team receive a mighty blow. Toivonen's Ascona 400 has broken a back axle within the last few miles, and the wobbling car cannot even reach the end of the stage. Not that this upsets Russell Brooks. Uh, Raise me, please. You know, it's very early days in the rally, and I think we're lying about fourth, so no problems. Back in 77, you said it would be a long time before an Irish driver won the circuit again. Do you think this might be the year that would change? I can't see it. I think one of the big problems is machinery. You know, the machinery is getting so specialised these days, and there aren't any Irish drivers other than Bertie Fisher uh, that have really got the very fast equipment. Uh, so we'll have to see how Bertie Fisher goes. I think. And Bertie is going superbly and clocking up very competitive stage times. Among the other Irish contenders are Brendan Fagan, the Dublin motorcycle dealer. The Knox brothers from Port Adan, and Dan Daly in the Datsun. Eklund's retirement means that Malcolm Nilsson 
now leads Group A from his teammate Louise Aiken, and he is having to use all his considerable skill to stay in front of the perky young Scott in her Ford Escort. The Opel team are still reeling from the news of Toivonen's retirement, but at least Jimmy's plans seem to be on target. Uh, I think we're lying about third, probably. Uh, there's a there's a time uh, dispute in the second stage. We reckon we were 20 seconds quicker than the timekeeper. We've put, you know, we've said to the organisers about it. It seemed a problem with the clock. If that's the case, we're either second or third. Traffic has become a problem by the time number 23 arrives. Driver Ernest Kidney, who has acquired some whiskers in his two years' absence from rallying, is making an impressive comeback. The sixth stage is where fate plays its April Fool on McRae's chances of making it four circuits in a row. They three-wheel the car to the end of the stage where a service wagon will patch the stricken machine. Bloomquist still leads, but Auricula is now second, and Brooks is up to third. Even some of the home drivers are struggling slightly here. And the ladies have their own struggle. In the contest, Louise Aiken, the petite Marie Maloney, Liz Montgomery and the very experienced Rosemary Smith. Her young rival, Louise, is setting the pace. Marie Maloney and uh, Rosemary Smith are in the dealer Opel Team Ireland cars. And Liz Montgomery, also in an Opel, is putting in a very crisp performance. but they all could give poor Bruce Blake a lesson or two, particularly about how to go round a hairpin. So hairpins obviously aren't Bruce's high point. The status of an official car is proportional to the number of aerials it carries. The occupants of the course cars probably knew by now that already there had been another dramatic change in the lead. Gearbox failure has ended the quattro domination of the event. With Bloomquist out, Auricola now leads the circuit. Shadowing the Lancia and less than two minutes behind is Russell Brooks. Ballon Amalad Bertie has a misfire, but he is certainly on form, pulling up to third place, just 40 seconds adrift of Brooks.
so it's been a very bad start for McRae's hopes, as the accident and the road penalties incurred while trying to repair the damage has dropped the Rothmans Opel driver down to a lowly 35th place. But he's not the only one having his problems, and it's only 80 stage miles down and still almost 450 to go. So the early retirements included a few major surprises. Billy Coleman, Henry Toivonen, Per Eklund, Stig Blomquist and almost Jimmy McRae. The rally circus heads south, crossing the border almost unnoticed. Because in rallying, as in many other sports, Ireland is at one. Mondello Racetrack. While most of the country is at breakfast, the rally competitors have already been on the road for five hours and raced over as many special stages. Dan Daly is the only top 20 retirement since the early restart in Belfast. Auricola in the evening Herald Lancia is the morning star. Mondello is something new for the circuit and the Kildare Motor Club are doing a fabulous job in keeping the 10,000 spectators amused. Dublin has turned out in force and the circus has truly come to town. the supercharged Lancia commands most of the attention. Of all the cars in the rally, this one should be the one most suited to the racetrack, given its very close Ferrari connections. So Penti Auricola starts the Mandelo stage. The rally leader heading down towards Shell Corner, the notoriously slippy right-hand hairpin. From slithering round Shell, it's across the track and line up for BOAC, then the long blast down the back part of the circuit. Unknown to them, this is Esso Corner, a very long left-hander, which has to be positioned right to be just on line for Bardol, which follows, and then up the Ford straight and into Dunlop Corner. A blind entry into this one, making it doubly difficult under braking, and then accelerating down the hill to complete one of the two laps on this special stage. What about this stage, Mondello Park? Well, you know, it's good for the spectators. you got to do it. Despite yet another off on his way to Mandela, McRae is now back up to 18th place. Suspension problems, the car's just not handling right. We'll get it right, then I dinged it off another banking last night. And we hope to get the suspension fixed in here. Do you think there's any possibility you could get back up to the top there? I doubt it now, no. No, uh, we're, too, we're too far behind. Unless, of course, the others, have, others have mishaps. Well, that's correct. I mean, there's a long way to go.
We've lost a bit of time this morning to the other drivers, but um, we think we've got our misfire cleared now, and uh, I'm beginning to feel a bit happier with the car, a little bit more confidence, taking quite a while to, you know, really get used to the car. Problems. We've had a very easy run. We're taking the time trying to get to Killarney. What, what position are you overall? I think we're back to sixth. Austin was quickest on us in the last two stages, so I think he's taking about ten back off us. We could go a bit quicker, certainly. Um, the tactic today is just to stay where we are, really, because I don't think we can catch the fastest events in front of us. So we've put a bit of time between us and people behind, so it's really just a question of staying there. In the meantime, I'm sure you'll be giving great entertainment to the spectators here at Mondello Park. Well, I hope it won't be too entertaining. <laughs> The rally returns to rural Ireland after the artificial but challenging crowd pleaser at Mandela. Time perhaps to focus in on some expert opinion. Brum, the Escona's wide bar exhaust produces a hundred plus decibels. Brum, brum. Would you expect any less from a 16 valve engine? That Fisher car has 255 brake horsepower from its twin overhead cam, 48 Webers, Still crying. Bert's and not a bad driver either. What about Terry Cavey then? Only 29 years of age and the Bra and British Rally Champion in 1980. And Jimmy McRae is lucky to be still going. He pulled the dual circuit AB ventilated disc and the front wishbone out of her yesterday. The last time I pulled a wishbone, it was from a turkey with my daddy at Christmas. What the experts don't know is that Penti Auricula has been off the road on the last stage and lost a further seven minutes. And Austin McHale, unfortunately, is soon to retire with a broken cam follower. Promoting Ernest Kidney to sixth. I was very apprehensive yesterday morning after not having done a rally for so long and uh, I really was very pleasantly surprised how we ended up last night. Winston Henry has one of those vintage RS 1800s up in 10th place. And perhaps now we could turn our attention to the next stage.
At Tornafala, Auricula is back up to fourth place, but on the wrong rubber. KB also finds this one slippery. And it's over again, boys, for here comes Fisher. Shaving off his rear bumper on the bridge. John Weatherly in the Group B Citroen Visa has managed to work his little plastic bombshell into 10th. And McRae is closing fast on the front runners, having just passed Louise, who is now in 13th position overall. Ronnie McCartney, after a lot of trouble on the first day, is becoming the entertainer of the rally as he flings the HSR from ditch to ditch in a highly spectacular fashion and he is only 20 seconds behind the Citroen. Although Chris Lord has moved up a place in Group A due to Malcolm Wilson's retirement, he still trails Louise Aiken, Robert Mahari and Stanley Orr. This is last year's Group A winner, Russell Close, who is not having the same success this year. as Ian Harrison witnessed. The final car we see through the 22nd stage is Damien Campbell's Talbot Sunbeam. At the last stage before that much needed rest in Killarney, we catch a glimpse of some of the lower runners, not superstars as yet perhaps, but obviously enjoying themselves. Trevor Fleming is, as always, one step ahead of the ladies. Ladies winner Rosemary Smith is having to give second best to a new talent in the shape of Louise Aiken. She is not only leading the ladies but also Group A and she is not a bit superstitious about arriving in Killarney in 13th place. The wilds of the Kerry Mountains and Moors is the venue for tomorrow's rallying but for some of the cars it's been quite a struggle even to get this far. The Sunday run, 10 classic stages through some of Ireland's most spectacular scenery, but this year the weather was not to be kind to our competitors. Easter Sunday does not start with any resurrection for Penty Auricula's hopes. He loses a further six and a half minutes with punctures on Moll's Gap, 
the day's first stage. That other charger, Jimmy McRae, was fastest on Mall's Gap and posted his intention of challenging Brooks for the Sunday run crown. Ronnie, still entertaining and still climbing up through the field, and brother Desi's rally is unlike the other Lancia, rather undramatic. This mid-engine customer car is simply not yet fast enough to take on the works machines. Louise is still ahead of the other ladies, but her Group A lead is beginning to be threatened. And Damien Campbell is proving a bit too fast for his car, as it is about to fall apart around him. Bill Murphy is still starting stage 26 as the leaders go on to tackle stage 27. Despite the pressure from McRae for the Sunday honours, Russell Brooks is still the Sabbath Supremo. KB is third, but has the Killarney cramps. His discomfort soon ends. Brake failure causes the Vauxhall to get stuck in a bog. The driver needs one, but not the HSR. For Jimmy, it's a good day for a change. And Desi is thoroughly enjoying his Sunday run. Oh God, I thought I'd seen a flying saucer. The high-speed jigs and reels through the rugged Kerry countryside have suddenly become more like a rain dance. Jimmy McRae, as happy as a two-year-old in a puddle, splashes his way further up the field. Brendan Fagan fights off pain from a broken bone in his hand, sustained in yesterday's accident. With skill and courage, he holds on to third place. Ernest still can't believe his luck in this one-off drive. In with the superstars in fourth position. DeMuth is now fifth and taking maximum advantage of the four-wheel drive in these conditions. Arikola now even further back is still obviously aware that they have only just about passed halfway mark in this rally. Despite punctures, he's not deflated, more determined. The Knox brothers, another private crew doing well in eighth position. And Ronnie McCartney was now just one place behind them. These two are in an optimistic mood, John Weatherly and Ronan Morgan punching up a lot of credit on their visa. Winston Henry was seventh, but a bent front strut is now costing him places and he is to retire on the last corner of today's last stage. A flat out drive around his province is little consolation for Billy Coleman. One of the early retirements, he re-entered the event just for the Sunday run. However, everybody is reminded of the rally master that he still is. In a strange car, atrocious conditions and running last, he finishes third. And even if Billy is nowadays in semi-retirement, there will always be other little Colemans to take his place. The rally is far from over, with still 19 stages to Belfast and 20 hours of driving in the Rothman circuit of Ireland. The restart is from Killarney Park Fermi at lunchtime, and something rather unusual is causing Killarney's umpteenth traffic jam for the weekend. The works Lancia refuses to start. Rising above the heads of the populace, like the tailplane of a 747, the bonnet of the supercar reveals the problem. 
Rainbows come and go, but the pot of gold is still there for the taking. Brooks leads the field on the long road home. There are still over 600 miles to go, and over 200 of them on special stages. Bertie Fisher is now over three minutes behind and quite content with second place. The sun has not set yet for the evening Herald Lancia, however, and Penty, with the Italian steed now fired up, is determined to gain ground during the run back to Belfast. Chris Lord is now leading Group A, despite a continuing fuel vaporization problem, while other cars have a different way of relieving themselves of excess fluid. And some weekend gossip arises when we catch uh, Brian Steenson sleeping with Joy McAdam. Number 106, Eugene Meegan, last but not least on the road. And another stage is completed. As the marshals head for home, time is now running out for Jimmy McRae and his climb back up the field. Determined to the end, the Scot assesses what his final positions could be on the leaderboard. Well, hopefully, I think the best we could expect would be third, so we're aiming for that at the moment. One little surprise for you, perhaps, that Penty Ricola is not quite as, quite as close as you may think, because he was just pushed out of Park Fermi again this morning, yeah, no, which adds on another 30 seconds. That's right, a 30 seconds penalty for that. So uh, that gives you a bit of breathing space behind you anyway? Yeah. It's, uh, we're having problems just now, they're changing an oil pump. I just hope we can get away from here in a couple of minutes' time. At the next stage, the gathering crowds are licked into shape. Some of them will have been here in the heat wave two years ago, when the action was unforgettable. Perhaps that is why the gentleman has acquired pole position. Back in 81, the same location looked something different. But Vauxhall driver Jim McDonald will remember it vividly. Jimmy McRae also kicked up the dust that year, but in a more professional manner. Today, Jimmy is now up to sixth, and his progress through the field will continue with driving like this. Brooks knows he can't afford to slacken the pace and he and Mike Broad look very much in command at the Andrews Heat for Hire Vauxhall. Fisher and Fraser may be settling for second, but it certainly doesn't show as the Fermanagh duo revel in the handling and the reliability of the GM dealer sport entry and set fastest time on the stage. But when it comes to the ragged edge, Penty has been over it on too many occasions already. This incident costs Penty vital seconds and lets the German champion, Harald de Moot, slip-slide his Audi into fifth place.
While E.T. phones home, we look back at another domestic connection. Co-driver Hilary Wilson has been telling her husband James where to go. Sometimes Hillary just has to hold on tight. After a 15-minute service is on to the next stage, where the spectators include some of the country's top brass. Among them, the Chief of Police, the Minister of Hedges and Ditches, protected as usual by the Special Branch, who are no doubt on the lookout for shady characters. Holy Mount is the penultimate stage today before the long-awaited supper halt in Galway. It seems that Penty Auricula is very, very hungry. The Lancia is surviving this punishing rally fairly well. Many had expected that this racing car would be far too wide and fragile. Russell Brooks now concentrates on avoiding any mistake at this stage. To do a spot of timekeeping in between taking pictures should be an easy task for a motorsporting journalist and competitor like Paul Phelan. Bertie Fisher tries to stretch it to the limits. And the timekeeper seems to be impressed. Third man Brendan Fagan, still on painkillers, remember, is soon to retire due to an unfortunate road accident. The Team PR Riley back Vauxhall has been under considerable pressure from McRae's Opel, which is now closing fast. Jimmy has the Irish crowds behind him all the way. Ronnie McCartney's entertaining driving has brought him up to 7th place. And he's now not far behind Ernest Kidney and co-driver Peter Scott in that Datsun. Kidney a little tired now but still maintaining that excellent showing. Stanley Orr's stylish driving of his RS2000 has impressed many along the route. He holds his class uh, lead comfortably by an incredible 10 minutes. Frank Fennell also leads his class, but by an even greater margin. Fate is soon to deal a cruel blow to the Talbot belonging to the Knox brothers. And this is the last time we see them on a stage. The Moots rally is also almost over. Meanwhile, others try to pick up those vacating places. Home. 
Humpty Humphrey sits on a wall. The Wilsons are up to no good at all. And all Lusty's horsepower. And McElroy's strain. Brings McCullough and Singleton together again. Stage 41 is cancelled due to accidents resulting in the retirement of Demut and the Knox brothers. A final service before supper and a two hour rest. Fisher in second is well ahead of Fagan. Does his service manager regard this as a secure margin? It gives him that wee bit of leeway if he has a puncture or something like that, but there is that other point, you know, if it, he thinks he has too big a cushion, then he can very easily relax too much and throw it away. So a serious misfortune for Russell Brooks, and this could be the first circuit win for Bertie and yourselves. Yeah, well, I wouldn't wish that on Russell either. Would I? But yet it could be. Well, I mean, there's, there's still quite a bit to do. The, the section after the leave out arrived and between there and, and uh, the north, I mean, that is a very, very tricky section of stages. So fingers crossed at the moment. That's the way it is at the moment, yeah. <laughs> The final leg eventually returns to Belfast. They complete the first half in darkness. Dawn on Easter Tuesday morning, the end of a long, cold and lonely night. The 5th of April welcomes the rally with snow and ice. The talk of the darkness hours is the charge of superfin Pentiauricula, whose steel nerve and cat-like vision has penetrated the night mists of Connemara and Leitrim to gain third place, only to have it all slip into a bog just three stages ago. Although the Lancia is still running, it looks as if it will be over the maximum time allowed. Others have dropped out during the night. John Weatherly's Citroen will not appear, and the life in Desi McCartney's engine has disappeared in the all-night marathon. Brooks has stretched his lead by almost a minute. Both he and Fisher are coping masterfully with the conditions. And McRae's magnificent drive brings him right back to third. He has made up 32 places in just three days. Dawn for Trevor Fleming is nothing new and the flying coal merchant is heading for circuit honours despite no sleep and a very light-hearted approach to rally. But all these survivors have to keep fighting that terrible tiredness for the few remaining stages. Breakfast time and an hour's rest. Russell Brooks has been to the manor borne by his Vauxhall Chevette. Thoughts of a bowl of crispies probably bring a little snap and crackle to pop. Well, I'm feeling very nervous now with three stages still to go. Well, you've, come a, you've held, the, held the lead for a long way. Surely uh, it, nothing can go wrong now. Well, we don't intend to lose it now. Well, we've even put some very strong tyres on, so we've got no chance of getting a puncture. So uh, it's ironical in a way that it's yourself a previous winner who should dethrone Jimmy McRae. Um, it's an event where experience counts for a tremendous amount, so I don't think that's so surprising in many ways. You know, it's um, uh, you've got to learn to pace yourself, and 
a knowledge of what the stages are like rather than the stages in detail is always very useful. We had a fairly undramatic night. We just drove as quick as we felt it was safe. We so had no pressure from behind. So. You're in a fairly secure position. You no chance of catching the leader, and you're fairly secure from behind. So yeah, we're, we're about four minutes behind Russell and uh, about 15 minutes in front of Jimmy. So, so you're not going to take any chances just to entertain the spectators not, or anything like that. Not a lot we're going to do, you know. <laughs> Third. Third now. Yep. That's a tremendous recovery from 35th. Are you satisfied with that? Yeah, I think we are. Really. Uh, I don't think we could wish for any better. I never thought we'd we would be thumped. Uh, do you, you know. shed a tear that you've uh, now lost the circuit after three years on the throne? Yeah, you've got to do it sometime. <laughs> I kind of win them all. Will you be back again to try and regain the crown? Oh yes, no. Uh, see if I'd won it this year, I might have said that I couldn't have come back. Try it for the first time. See, I'll let you come back now. You've lost the beard since we last spoke to you a few days ago at Mandelo Park. Yeah, that's true. Does that make you go any quicker? I don't know, I thought it <laughs> might. I'm not sure whether it did or not. It might have been contributed to something. Well, obviously, I mean, your overall position at the moment is... Uh, does that not surprise you? Oh yes, if someone had asked me at the start of the rally how I was going to end up, I wouldn't have been as optimistic as that by any means. I'd be certainly very pleased. So is your position at present secure? Well, I, you, know, you can never be sure. I mean, there can be me mechanical mishaps and that sort of thing, but... Um, There's no one close enough to worry you? Oh, no. Um, Ronnie's about five or six or maybe even seven minutes behind and, um, well, we know who's in front and I'm not going to catch him. The role of honour. Louise Aiken and Ellen Morgan hadn't just won the ladies, they had impressed everyone and vanquished many more experienced competitors. Keith Edwards and John King proved that good results can still be achieved on low budgets. Stanley Orr and Jimmy Davidson displayed the true art of rallying. Frank Fennell and Tom Callaghan, the top South of Ireland crew. Kieran and Langley Humphreys, a family triumph. Sean Burke and Hugh O'Donnell, perseverance and pace. And tremendous Trevor comes home in 13th place. Again, Fleming has finished the circuit in magnificent style. Thirteenth overall, but perhaps it is the spectators that are lucky on this occasion. But the power and the glory must go to the top six finishers. Chris Lord is not only sixth, but he is also the most law-abiding competitor. So Russell Brooks becomes a member of the elite club of three-time winners of the Circuit of Ireland, joining Paddy Hopkirk, Roger Clark and Jimmy McRae. But for Jimmy, that brow on Friday was the April Fool that he'll never forget. <laughs>